Welcome back. Remember last time we were talking about the 12th dynasty and Egypt was really doing fine. You had the kings, the Amenemets and the Sesostrises and they were building pyramids, sending expeditions out. Uh, Egypt was really on a roll. Well, as I said at the end, uh, it didn't last. The second intermediate period, what we're going to talk about today, is the second time that Egypt collapses almost totally. Uh, I said it once before, uh, I'm pretty sure it's true that Egypt is the only civilization in the world that ever collapsed completely twice and got its act back together again. And what we'll do today is we'll look at this second collapse. Now, it's different from the first intermediate period in that the first intermediate period, we're not really sure what happened. Why did it go downhill? Remember we talked maybe Pepe II got too old and couldn't rule the country. Maybe it was they stopped building pyramids or something. And we don't really know for sure. But this, we start to get an idea, a pretty good idea. What you're going to see today is three distinct phases. I'm going to try to cover three phases. We're going to see the next dynasty, Dynasty 13, which is going to go downhill. You're going to see Egypt weakening. And then we're going to see another period where Egypt is ruled by foreigners. And that's the reason it really goes downhill. Egypt, in a sense, is perhaps conquered. And then the last, the, the good part, the, the part I like to tell about, is when Egypt kicks out the foreigners and Egypt is on top again. So we'll three, see three distinct periods. Egypt on the downhill, Egypt really conquered, and then Egypt on top again. Right? So hang on and you'll see Egypt up, up there again. Uh, let me say something about Dynasty 13. Right? In a sense, it's a lost dynasty. We have the names of 10 kings or so, but we don't know much about them. Um, they built some pyramids, which is a sign that everything isn't falling apart. Uh, there are some pyramids at Dashur, for example. Now, again, remember, you know, you've heard that name Dashur quite often. They're going back to the good old days. They're going back to the time of Sneferu, who built his pyramids at Dashur. Um, they're saying, we somehow are still associated with pe this period of greatness. You know, I often wonder, though, what do they feel? See, the pyramids that they built are small mud brick affairs. They're, you know, where, where, where Sneferu's is a few hundred feet high, you're talking about 150 feet high made of mud brick. When you're in the shadow of Sneferu's pyramid, and when these guys are building their pyramids at Dashur, they can see Sneferu's. You can see Sneferu's pyramids from miles away. Miles away. They're building these little pyramids. Did they feel sort of an inferiority complex of, gee, we couldn't quite do anything like this? One of the guys who built the Dashur did, in fact, say, not since the time of Sneferu has its like been done. Uh, well, it wasn't really like Sneferu. Uh, but they did build the Dashur. Uh, I, I have a hunch, though, that one of the reasons they built the Dashur was for religious-magical purposes. In the Old Kingdom, immortality wasn't quite yet for everybody. The general feeling I get from reading texts and, and just looking at monuments is that, no question about it, the pharaoh was going to resurrect. He's a god. He's related to the gods. But the only shot you had at it maybe as a commoner is if you were maybe a member of the court and were associated with the pharaoh, and he would give you a really great sort of bonus. He would let you be buried near his pyramid. Then maybe you'd be resurrected, you know? Um, but eventually that became sort of more democratized. Everybody thought, thought they could be immortal. And I think maybe these pharaohs of the later dynasties who are building their pyramids near Sneferu have a little bit of that. I'm building near Sneferu because he's going to resurrect for sure. He was a real god. Maybe I'll go with him. So it's sacred ground that they're building on. So there are a couple of small pyramids. Um, one king of the dynasty, Hor is his name, H-O-R. That's the Egyptian word for Horus. You know, the Greeks added the, the U.S. ending at the end. So Hor means Horus. So he's saying he's Horus. Um, king Hor had a short reign, but a pyramid at, at Dashur. And what I love about his pyramid is they found a statue, really neat statue. It's life-size, made out of wood. Now, let me say this. Wood was expensive in Egypt. This is a sign that they're not completely downhill. A life-size statue out of wood was really something, because most of the wood was imported. They didn't have really forests for timber. They had some acacia trees. They used acacia, things like that. And if you look at wooden statues in Egypt, you know, if you look at ancient Egyptian wooden statues, you'll see they're pegged together out of little pieces. Very often they'll take a little plug and put it in the shoulder. They'll take something else and put it here. They're using every little piece they can. But Hor has a life-size statue. Now, it's a Ka statue. Remember we talked about the Egyptians believed that there were different parts of the soul. And the Ka was kind of like your double, you know, sort of like your ethereal double. And 
the hieroglyph for Ka, it's written in English, K-A, is two arms, uh, kind of upraised. The best I can tell you is it looks just like in a football game when the referee says field goal and raises his arms up, it looks just like that. And the Ka statue of Hor, it, it's almost, you know, to us it looks almost comical. To make sure that his soul wouldn't make any mistake, that this is the statue for you, on the top of his head are two large arms that look like he's saying, field goal. You know, not his arms coming from his shoulders, they're just mounted on the top of the head saying, this is the Ka statue. But it's a wonderful work of art. It's kind of a holdover from the previous dynasty. When they can do good art, they knew what they were doing. There are also four small pyramids of this period at Saqqara, right? Again, at least they're building pyramids. Um, but let me say why I say there's a decline. The last 57 years of this dynasty, there's another dynasty, right? A 14th dynasty. They call themselves the 14th. They're ruling from the delta. Right? Now, the delta, right? let me describe the delta. It's not too far away, so it's a sign that kingship is weakening. Remember, we have the, the capital was in the Fayum. And the reason the capital's in the Fayum is for military purposes. That's why those guys moved it to the Fayum. In case anybody invades from the north, you've got, you're right at the top of, of Egypt, almost. Uh, you can control it. But these people are ruling, or calling themselves kings anyway, in the delta. Now, the delta is called the delta, if you will remember, because when the Greeks came into Egypt from the north, they came via the Mediterranean, and they saw this marshy land that was shaped like a triangle, which is the Greek letter delta. So they called it the delta. The delta is very moist. It's very difficult to excavate in the delta. When, you know, when Egyptology really started, it was really to prove the Bible. In the end of the 19th century, and in England, the first exploration society to explore Egypt was called the Delta Exploration Society. Now, why would you dig in the Delta when, you know, it's such a hard excavation? The reason is they thought the Israelites went out that way, right? If they got out of Egypt, they went through the Delta, and everybody was looking for proof of the Bible. So it was first the Delta Exploration Society. Soon after, they changed their name to the Egypt Exploration Society, broadened their approach, and that's what it is today. In England today, you still have the Egypt Exploration Society. Now, the delta, as I say, is a very difficult place to excavate because it's moist. Now, the best description I can give you to imagine is the Nile, as you know, flows from south to north. At Khartoum, two rivers join, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, forming our Nile, going north. But as it gets towards the Mediterranean, the Nile branches out. And if you imagine a hand going towards the Mediterranean with the fingers towards the top, the wrist and the arm is the Nile. But then you get several branches, half dozen branches of the Nile going to the Mediterranean. And that's going to give you a lot of moisture in the delta. That is the delta. The delta is the hand part of my metaphor. And you've got different branches of the Nile. So you've got water everywhere. And when these guys from the Delta Exploration Fund started excavating, they had a lot of trouble with water. And it's still hard. And what that means for us is that we don't have many records from the Delta because everything sunk down. Temples that were built are gone under the water. So Delta is a very hard place to excavate. But somewhere in the Delta, you've got some 14th Dynasty people claiming that they're kings. Uh, but it's certainly a sign that Egypt is weakening. When you have two groups claiming to be the pharaohs, there are problems. Now, you've got this 13th and 14th dynasty. The ends are sort of going at the same time. Then we've got the 15th dynasty. This is going to be our second phase. Remember, we have three phases. Egypt is weakening. That's dynasty 13 with dynasty 14. But now we're going to get Egypt under foreigners, dynasty 15. These people are called the Hyksos. Now, Hyksos is a word made up of two Egyptian words. And it's mistranslated often in the past. Now we've got it pretty much right. Almost everybody agrees. But it used to be said that these people were shepherd kings. Now, I think the idea was that they were nomadic wanderers who came into Egypt and somehow took over. But now we know the translation that's really correct is foreign kings. Foreign kings. See, one of the difficulties about figuring out who these people really were is that the Egyptians had a very special sense of history. They never kept records of the bad days. In other words, if you read battle accounts of ancient Egyptian wars, they never lost a battle. 
You know, you'll get accounts of pharaohs who won every single battle. They just kept winning them closer to home, you know, as they retreated. Uh, so the Egyptians didn't have a sense of history like we do that you have to be accurate, you have to keep it all right. So we don't have a lot of records of these people. But in general, we call them the foreign kings, the Hyksos. Now, we're pretty sure that they're Semites coming from what might be Palestine area, Canaan, somewhere around there. They may not have even just conquered. They may not have just came in and conquered. It could be they lived in Egypt for quite a while and then sort of somehow just took over. The reason I say that is, remember last time we talked about the tombs of Beni Hassan? Those were the tombs where the nomarchs were that were kind of very grand during the 12th dynasty, during the Middle Kingdom? Well, the tombs of Beni Hassan show Semites in Egypt. We can tell they're Semites. They have little beards. They wear different clothes. They have kind of colored cloth like a kaftan with lots of you know, fancy designs. Uh, they're bringing tribute, they're bringing trade goods, things like that. So there's no question about it. Semites were living in Egypt before this period. So there may have been a lot of Semites there and then just take over. Or perhaps they really come in and conquer. We don't know for sure. But anyway, we do know that these Hyksos set up shop in the Delta, in the north. And they establish a capital called Avarice. Now, again, remember, it's moist in the delta. We don't have very much in the way of artifacts from these people. They really are a mystery. There's an excavation going right on, right? It's, it's, they're doing it, they're, they're plowing right on, but they're not finding as much as they'd like. Manfred Bitok is doing it right now. It's at Tel Daba, which is the modern name of where Avarice was. He's from the University of Vienna, but it's a hard excavation. The water table's fairly high. But he's found some interesting things. Uh, let me tell you what he has found. One is that these Hyksos were somehow interacting with other foreigners. One of the big surprises of Betok's excavation is that he found frescoes, paintings from walls at Avarice, the Hyksos capital, damaged, but big enough fragments, say, bigger than your fist, bigger than your hand, that show that they had paintings from, like Minoan artists had done them from Crete. So these are certainly, they probably had Cretan artists maybe who were doing them or they'd seen these, but there's this exchange somehow of Minoan art with the Hyksos. Very curious. The Egyptians never had this. So they're doing, you know, foreign things. There's even a jar with a Hyksos cartouche, you know, the, the oval, found at Knossos on Crete in the palace. So maybe the Hyksos sent some sort of presence there. They got artists back. But the Hyksos are not just staying put in the Delta. Now, they worship strange gods, these Hyksos. I mean, really strange. One is Seth. Now, remember from our mythology lecture that Seth was the evil god? He's the one who hacked Osiris into 13 pieces and then tries to, you know, really destroy him. These guys worship Seth. Now, in some sense, it sounds like they were devil worshipers. In some sense. It's not quite right. Because believe it or not, there were some Egyptians who were mainstream, establishment, who worshipped Seth. We don't really understand how you can do this. What, what may be the case is that sometime in a later period, Seth becomes a good guy. You know, well, there's Seth. Of the, oh, there's that Seth who killed Osiris. No, no, that's not that Seth. It's this Seth. But there's this strange thing about worshipping this, this, what seems to be the bad god. Now, Seth was represented by an animal. And the animal is called the Seth animal because it's like, like no animal we've ever seen has the head, it looks a little bit like a, a goat almost, with kind of ram-shaped horns going back. And then it has a tail, it has a body more like a feline or canine, and it has a tail that's forked at the end that goes up into the air. Right? It's like a, almost like an animal that's decided by committee. Um, it's interesting that this evil one has a forked tail, you know, kind of the devil always has. But um, that's the animal that usually represents Seth. Very strange that he was so prominent in Egyptian mythology and worshipped by these Hyksos. They also brought in their own god. They have a god, Reshep, who was a god of storms, right? Kind of interesting. Also war, right? War and storm. What I wonder about the Hyksos, because they were these foreign people, um, did they have temples like the Egyptians? You know, Egyptian temples were a big deal. They were you know, large affairs with lots of priests bustling around. Did the Hyksos have them? If they did, the temples are gone. But they don't really seem to have integrated. One of the things about the Hyksos that I think is, is important 
is they were illiterate. They seem to be illiterate. At least we don't have carvings on walls that they've left. And the reason I'm pretty sure they were close to illiterate is they carved scarabs, you know, those little beetles that were carved out of stone to be amulets. And often, if you were an Egyptian and carved a scarab, you would do it with your name on the bottom and, and maybe a, a, a sort of a magical prayer. You know, you'd say, there are scarabs that say Happy New Year, for example, you know, or good health to you. The scarabs that these Hyksos carved are just kind of mainly scroll work designs, you know, geometrics, not like they were into the language at all. And scarabs are important to us because, you know, scarabs travel easily. They're small. They're trade objects. You can give one away. Somebody takes it. He takes it home with him. Doesn't have to pack it. Scarabs travel like beads. You know, ask any archaeologist. Beads get around. You know, you find beads from this civilization and another civilization. You don't find many Hyksos scarabs in the south. It looks like they stayed put in the delta. They may have gone north to Crete. You know, they may have done something. But they didn't go south. You don't find Hyksos scarabs. So anyway, these were a strange crew. Um, some people think, and, and it's just a, just a possibility, some people think that the Hyksos are really Joseph and his brothers. Remember in the Bible, the Israelites go into Egypt, Joseph goes into Egypt, and eventually his brothers go into Egypt? Some people think that the Hyksos may have been Joseph, but we'll talk about that later. That's an interesting question. But these Hyksos seem to be happy ruling from the north, staying in the delta, we have very few monuments of theirs. The excavation hasn't revealed as much as we'd like. I mean, for example, as you know, I'm a mummy person. You know, my specialty is mummies. One of the things I would like to know is did they mummify their dead? We don't have bodies yet of Hyksos. We don't have Hyksos kings, you know. All we have are these little scarabs with scroll-like designs. Uh, I'm hoping somebody will be found intact. But you see, in the delta, it's moist. The flesh is going to be gone, I'm pretty sure. And I'll, I'll, never, I'll probably never find that out. But anyway. Um, the Hyksos, anyway, are eventually overthrown. That's the good news, and that's the part of the story I like. That's our third section for today, where I'm going to try to show you that Egypt eventually, I mean, it's really a, a battle, but they eventually kick the Hyksos out. Now, that's the story of Dynasty 17. Now, you'll notice I've talked about Dynasty 13 and 14, showing that there's a decline. Talked about Dynasty 15, Right, showing that those are the Hyksos. Now, Dynasty 16, I haven't said. Right? I'm going to Dynasty 17. There is no Dynasty 16. It just, it's, a, it's a spurious dynasty. There's probably no real kings there. Uh, dynasty 17 is what we really have to go to. That's where it's really happening. Now, there are princes who are ruling in Thebes. As I said, the Hyksos seem to be pretty happy just staying put in the delta. But in the south, Thebes, which is a good-sized city, is being ruled by Theban princes. And now our story starts, the story of the expulsion of the Hyksos, starts with a letter, an inflammatory letter, sent by the Hyksos king. His name is Apophis, right? We have a papyrus. And it's generally believed, or was believed, that the papyrus is a literary papyrus. It's a fiction. It's a short story. It's actually a novella. And this is what it says. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Apophis, the Hyksos king, sends a letter to the Theban prince. Now, the Theban prince's name is Second and Ray Tau II. We just call him Second and Ray. And it says, now remember, they're 500 miles apart, right? The delta is in the north, Thebes is 500 miles in the south. And it says, the hippopotami in your pools are keeping me awake at night. They have to be silenced. Right? No. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? It's certainly inflammatory. We just don't quite understand what it means. But this is the papyrus that we have. What is Second and Ray's response? Gets an army to march north. What happens? We don't know. <laughs> the papyrus breaks off. We don't have the ending. Let me say one thing about papyrus. It's important. I will get to a suggested ending, I promise. But you have to understand something about papyrus. It's one of Egypt's great contributions. It's the first paper in the history of the world. It's made by taking a stalk of the papyrus plant. And papyrus used to grow wild in Egypt. It doesn't grow wild anymore. 
right? It's, it's all cultivated for tourists to make new papyri to sell. But it used to grow wild, and it grew big, bigger than sugarcane. Probably, sometimes, it, uh, the diameter of a stalk of papyrus could be as much as six inches. And the way you made papyrus was, you took the stalk, and you cut it into, say, 18-inch chunks. And then you cut it lengthwise to get some nice strips out of the middle. So you had these long, thin, 18-inch strips of papyrus. And then you put them on the ground, and you overlapped the edges just a little bit until you formed something that looked like a big page. And you took a wooden mallet, and you beat it. Right? You pound it, not tearing it. Fibers, fibers are pretty rough, but you pounded it with your wall, mallet. And then you left it out in the sun to dry. You didn't have to glue them together. The sap of the papyrus does the gluing. Once it dries, you cut it into a page size. Nice, neat trimming. You know, they had paper cutters, the equivalent of paper cutters. And then you take a stone, a smooth stone from the river, and you burnish it, you polish it, to get it smooth so you can write on it. Right? This is what was used in ancient Egypt for a lot of records. Now, the great thing about papyrus is if it's in the south, where it's dry, it'll last forever. That's why we have so many papyri. Now, if you wanted to tell a long story, you wanted to write a novel, they didn't have books in the sense of pages stacked on top of one another and bound or sewn together. They made papyrus rolls. You could take this 18-inch page, glue it to another one, and you'd have two. Glue as many as you want. Papyrus is pretty flexible. You can roll it. And that's how they kept it. You know, I don't know when the first bookshelf was invented, but it wasn't in Egypt. They had little niches for putting papyri in. But they had big rolls of papyri. So if you had a story like this one, where Apophis is writing and saying, you know, your hippopotami keep me out, it's a long story, you wrote it on a papyrus roll, and you rolled it up. But what happened over the thousands of years, and this is common to all our papyri, and this is why we don't have the ending, the parts of the papyri that are damaged most readily is the first and the last page. The first page is on the outside. <laughs> that gets bumped around, knocked, right? And the last page is all the way on the inside, and it's coiled so tightly that sometimes it cracks and breaks. So very often in a papyrus, we do not have the beginning and the end. This is a papyrus where we just don't have the end. Later, I'll be telling you about how you write on papyrus and, and, and even telling you how to write your own names better than, better than I suggested before. But what happened to the ending of this papyrus? Is there any way we can figure it out? The answer is yes, I think so. We have the mummy of second and Ray Tao, the prince who marches off to do battle with Apophis. His mummy exists. It's in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo in the mummy room, and you can go and see it. And it's an amazing thing to see. It's not your ordinary mummy. If you look at the mummy's head, and that's what I really want to talk about. We'll talk about the mummy's hands, too. They're important. But if you look at the mummy's head, you will see that there are wounds, many wounds on the head. It's almost hard to orient yourself. You can't quite make out where the eyes are. There's a large opening in the skull on the forehead. There's a couple of puncture wounds behind the ear. This is a mummy that died violently. There's no question about it. And the suggestion is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's been suggested that he died in battle. And I think that's certainly possible. Uh, let me tell you why it sounds like he died in battle, but I'll give you one reason why maybe he didn't, but certainly died violently. The wounds look like they were made from spears being thrust in and perhaps axes. It's like an axe wound type thing. Forensic people all would say the same thing. The one reason I'm a little hesitant to say he died in battle, really fighting his way, you know, with, with Apophis, is that usually when you get people who die violently like this, you get broken arms. Because as blows are being, your, your tendency is to put your arm up and fend off the blow with your forearm. And usually when you get violent head wounds, things like that, you also get arm. It may be, though, that perhaps one blow does it. You know, he's, he's hit from behind, he goes down, and then while he's on the ground, people are doing him in. But certainly several people were responsible simultaneously for the death of Second Array. So I think he may indeed have died in battle. Now, we have his mummy. It's interesting 
they brought him back to Egypt for burial, right? I mean, they brought him back to Thebes. He dies probably in the Delta, and they're bringing him back for a proper burial. But you know, they couldn't do it properly. They didn't have the embalmer's workshop in the Delta, so they bring the body back as best they can. They put some spices inside the body cavity, but he's never really fully embalmed. It's, 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 it's sort of like a, almost like a battlefield embalming. They're doing the best they can. Sometimes in surgery, you know, you do the best you can. It's an amputation that's done quick and dirty, not easy. But things on battlefields can't be done easily. So they do the best they can, but they bring their pharaoh back. But remember, it's going to take a couple of weeks, maybe, to get him back to Thebes. It's a long haul. It's 500 miles. So we have the mummy of second ray, and it suggests he dies in battle. Right? Not a happy ending to the papyrus that's damaged. But there is a happy ending, at least for me, because I love Egypt. Um, he has two sons, Kamos and Amos. Right? Kamos, by the way, think of the name. You're getting a feeling for Egyptian names by now. Ka means the soul, and Mos is born. The soul is born. Right? That's one way to do it. Um, Kamos goes north and does battle, avenges his father. Right? And, it, and it's interesting. We have records of this battle, of what Kamos did. Now, Kamos carved it on a stella. Remember? Stella, the big round top stones. He carved the stella, put it up in Karnak Temple for everybody to see about how he does in the Hyksos. Now, how does he do it? Marches north. Avarice is a walled city. So they're laying siege to the city. They're not letting Apophis out, right? Not letting him out. Apophis sneaks a messenger out, and the messenger is going south to Nubia, where the gold is, where the Egyptians had always gotten their gold, and where the Egyptians had always gone to beat up the Nubians to make sure they get the gold. So the Nubians are no friends of the Egyptians. And Apophis sends a letter, and it says, send troops, and we'll divide Egypt between us, right? So he wants to have a confederation with the Nubians to defeat Kamos. But the messenger never got through. Kamos Stella tells us they captured the messenger, and the Nubians never learned about it. So we know that Kamos has sieged this town and really done a job on Apophis from this Stella. There are actually two versions of the Stella, even one's very damaged. Um, he must have put it up in various places. This was like a big deal to talk, tell people about. So we know that Kamos goes north and does a number on Apophis. But he doesn't do the final number. That's interesting. Kamos dies, and the final expulsion of the Hyksos is by his brother, Amos. And we have records of Amos expelling the Hyksos also. And the records come, interestingly, from a military man's tomb. A man called Amos, son of Ibana. And Amos, son of Ibana, was a career military man. There were lots of those in Egypt. The military was a way to, you could rise up through the ranks and do quite well. Because one of the reasons you could do quite well is they had plundering. When you went into you know, a town and you won and you were victorious, you took everything that wasn't nailed down. And often the pharaoh rewarded you. Amos, son of Ibana. His career spanned three different pharaohs. And he went with Amos, the brother of Kamos, north to defeat the Hyksos. And what he says, and it's on the walls of his tomb, it's a wonderful, wonderful, long narrative of the career of this military guy who was very proud. He tells about how he was rewarded and what he did, but they chased the Hyksos all the way north to Palestine. So the Hyksos are finally kicked out of Egypt. Right? So we, we do have a kind of resolution to it. These foreigners, these vile Hyksos, are kicked out. And Amos, son of Abana, the military man, he tells us. He says, you know, the Pharaoh rewarded me. I was given slaves. In other words, when you're there, you can capture people, you know? And he captured four people. So he's given four slaves. He's allowed to keep them. Sometimes when the Egyptians brought back slaves, they didn't bring back large numbers, but they brought back slaves. They were given to the temple. These were the people who did the work in the temple. Right? They would clean the temple, do whatever. So we do have a clear, clear picture here that the Hyksos are finally expelled. Kamos starts it. Amos finishes it. And Amos is going to be the first king of the next dynasty. Now, we've been doing things chronologically, 
But I, next time I want to take a little side trip. Remember I mentioned that Joseph and his brothers may have been the Hyksos, some people think that. Next time I want to talk about the Bible story of Joseph and how an Egyptologist looks at it to see whether it sounds right or wrong. So that's what we'll do next time.